Can I welcome everyone to the 31st meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2017, and can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting. The first item of our business is our second evidence session as part of the early scrutiny of the Scottish Government's proposed education reforms. Last week we had a very interesting evidence session with academics. This week can I welcome Frank Lennon, a recently retired head teacher and a representative of the Commission on School Reform. Danielle Mason, Mason, Head of Research at the Education Endowment Foundation, and Dr. Rebecca Widdlefield, Chief Executive Officer of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Good morning. I'll begin questions before inviting contributions from the other members. Last week, we heard about the evidence base for the proposed education reforms. Do the panels have any views on how best to implement these reforms, particularly in regard to the changing governance and accountability structures? And if they have got differing views from the reforms, if they would like to expand a wee bit on what their alternative would be, that would be helpful. Would anybody like to be here? Um, so the starting point for me in preparing for this session has been looking at the evidence of what works to improve outcomes for pupils in education. Uh, at the Education Endowment Foundation, we, we aim to improve education by supporting schools to act on the evidence. And at the, at the very highest level, what the evidence tells us is that approaches which focus on the quality of pedagogy and interaction between pupils and teachers are the approaches which can have the biggest impact and actually at the lowest cost. So I found it valuable to consider uh, how the different elements of these reforms can deliver better quality teaching and learning. And I think there's just two important points that I wanted to start with. So the first is that autonomy needs to be accompanied by support and good evidence. It's no good having the freedom to make decisions if you're not also provided with high quality evidence to support your decision making. And just to illustrate the point, uh, many individual school level interventions aren't effective at raising attainment. So only one in four of the projects that we assess when they're robustly evaluated demonstrate enough promise to warrant further funding. And that figure is in line with similar organisations to us. So school leaders who are making decisions about teaching practice and curriculum implementation, they need high quality evidence of what works and what doesn't. And I think the second point I wanted to make is that collaborations need to maintain a strong focus on pupil outcomes. So again, we've evaluated a number of projects which involve collaborations between schools or the sharing of interventions and approaches. And as you would expect, collaboration in and of itself isn't enough to improve outcomes. Our experience is that collaborations work when they're structured around interventions and, and approaches that focus on improving the quality of teaching and learning. Thank you very much. Anybody else? I mean, just building on that, I mean, I think there's a key point about, we've, we often talk a lot about evidence into policy, but then evidence into practice and how actually things are implemented is as, as, as equally as important. Um, so the policy might be sound, but if it's not implemented effectively on the ground, it's still not going to achieve the outcomes that are, are being sought. I mean, others like Danielle are better placed to talk about the specifics of education reform. I'm, I'm not an education expert, but there seem to be some fundamental basics which are about engaging with people, so taking folks with you, and that's sort of consistent with any uh, sort of change program and being willing to learn as those ch as changes are implemented so that you continually improve what's being done and building capacity and capabilities as Danielle was saying as well is, is really important and allowing sufficient time I, I think the spice paper in particular um, gave a clear example in Sweden where rapid decentralization had had um, <coughs> not the best outcomes because it had been done very quickly um, so taking account of the readiness of a system to change and piloting where that makes sense I think is quite important in terms of making sure that the implementation on the ground is as, as led by evidence as, as actually the policy itself. Thank you. Mr Lennon? Well, I think the focus on implementation is the, is the critical bit um, the, uh, about where we are in the reform of s schools. I frankly think that structure is important, that, that if, if pedagogy and pupil relationships are central to improvement of learning and teaching, the culture in which the, these thrive is determined by the structure. So I think the Scottish Government is quite right to reform the structure and to push in the direction of more autonomy. So I'm very much in favour, both from my experiences uh, of being a head teacher, but also I think just someone who's a children that's gone through the system, that um, more autonomy at school level is definitely worth pursuing. 
I think the difficulties are how it is done. I'm a bit puzzled as to why in the government proposals there is no sectoral um, identification. It's all schools, irrespective, it would appear, whether they're primary or secondary, irrespective of their state of readiness or their willingness, they've all got to do it. So there's an irony here. We want schools to have more decision-making power. We want a school-led system, another phrase that I'm strongly in favour of, and I think the Commission School Reform has been arguing this point for at least four years, possibly longer. Um, but the irony is that in, in order to give schools more autonomy, we're compelling them to take more autonomy. And that seems a bit perverse to me. And it's possibly unnecessary. Why we can't have incremental change, this would deal with the point that Rebecca has made about you know, getting the pacing right. I think more autonomy is likely to be more successful if the schools judge themselves to be ready for it. If they have an assessment of their own capacity and readiness. And I'm in no doubt that there would be a significant number of schools that would judge themselves to be ready for it. These are likely to be in the secondary sector, I, I would suggest. And there's some sort of survey evidence that, that kind of indicates this. Primary head teachers, I think, on the whole, are much less willing to take on the risks as they see it of being cast adrift from the local authority, if cast adrift is an accurate way of describing it. But I also think if, if there was a, a degree of school control over the timing of the autonomy and the extent to which they embraced the details of the, of the head teacher's charter, that would encourage a buy-in and would reduce the chances of a kind of grudging compliance. And that's one of the problems we've got in Scotland, I think, this notion of compliance on the one hand with whatever the employer, i.e. the local authority, says that a school must or must not do. I mean, recently we had school uh, local authorities determining the number of subjects that, that had to be offered in, in fourth year. Clearly not a, a, a wise um, policy. But if there's some school involvement in that, I, I think that would reduce the chances of there being a kind of grudging compliance and therefore perpetuating what I think is a, a characteristic of the Scottish education system, which is this conformity compliance um, situation. Secondly, I think it would encourage more diversity. There may well be schools, given their circumstances, that will come up with much more imaginative ways of engaging parents, of ensuring a degree of democratic accountability. I know the local authority argument is, well, what happens if schools are completely autonomous? I'm personally not in favour of schools becoming employers, but there ought to be a way of ensuring a high degree of local accountability by, for example, requiring school boards or parent councils or, 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 or whatever um, organisation Set, whatever organisational setup we, we choose to help monitor schools, we could require them to allow every elected member. Most schools are now in multi-member boards. You could have four elected members on a school board that would, would guarantee a degree of democratic accountability. So I think autonomy and structure, therefore, can lead to culture change, encourage innovation, and I think there is a lack of innov innovative thinking in Scottish education. I'm not blaming anyone for this, this is just the way it has been recently. But I do think that the, the, the most urgent thing that we face at the moment, given that we have a head teacher's charter that pretty clearly spells out what controls, or what decision making schools should control, I think it's all about how we do this. And I think the lockstep change where everyone at the same time um, defined, it seems to me, by a political timetable, we have to show measurable improvement within the lifetime of this parliament. Well, Danielle's already suggested, Rebecca's already suggested that it could take a lot longer than three or four. I mean, I know this parliament's going to be extended by another year or, or, or whatever. It's still not going to be enough to demonstrate real improvement or real narrowing in the improvement gap, although there may well be some indications of it. So it does seem to me that we need to seriously consider how we do this and, and, and have serious look at allowing schools to make some kind of self-evaluation of their readiness and their capacity to take on the new responsibilities. Okay, thank you, Mr Lennon. Part of the reason, well, the reason why we're here is that we, we want to have a close look at it and see if there's anything that needs to be done or any suggestions that can come from the committee. Just to go back on the point about the, the, the lock change, step lock change that you talk about, the, the, um, as, as a danger of them not having a date, the schools not having a date, 
the, some that may be comfy with what they're doing, deciding that they want to stay as they are, even if it's to the benefit of certain people, but not the pupils. Now, I mean, I can see the argument there. If, if, if you go for lockstep change, then everyone's in the same boat, even if the boat's sailing around in circles for years. That, that, you know, that in itself is a bit of a danger. And I suppose if you allow a degree of incremental change, then early adopters might gain an advantage or a disadvantage and therefore jeopardise some concept of equality or equity. But we've been here for four decades. You know, I've been in, in, in education for four decades. We've hardly moved the attainment gap or any other, or other gap you care to look at between the, the most advantaged and the least advantaged. It does seem to me that this direction, uh, this change of direction is long overdue, and I'm just very disappointed that it's not more widely supported. I think that's partly because the education debate, probably since the implementation of Curriculum for Excellence, has become politicised to a way, party politicised, I mean, um, in a way that wasn't before. There was tremendous consensus during the national debate and fo on, on immediately following it on the purposes of Scottish education, a remarkable achievement. I think when you look back on it, that we've got f a fairly clear definition of the philosophy of Scottish education. No one argues about the four capacities any longer. It's all about the implementation. And here we are now following a period of, I suppose, budget budgetary constraint during the implementation of curriculum flexions. Certainly didn't help matters. But there is now a feeling, and I deeply regret this, I have to say, that the, the, the position adopted in some of the education debate is determined about whether or not you support one party over another. And I, I just think it's about um, time we, we set that aside and said, what, you know, look closely at what the government proposals for a head teacher charter, um, it seems to me, should have overwhelming support. The fact that they don't bothers me. And I think it's partly because we haven't made clear the sectoral differences and we haven't signalled up to the profession as a whole that their particular anxieties, given their circumstances, size, sector, simply aren't mentioned in the document at all. And that's, I think, a mistake. But it's a rectifiable mistake. We're, we're, we're at the beginning of the process, so... Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Waterfield. I'll just pick up on the lockstep um, conversation. Uh, I mean, I'm a researcher by background, and so I take as my starting point the evidence base. And it does seem to be, um, and as I say, I'm not an education expert, but it does seem to be, at least in certain spheres, there is the evidence base is contested or at least not unambiguously clear in terms of the right approach. And so unless we are really clear about what works, there is an advantage sometimes in piloting so that you can test out different approaches and then you can learn so that actually when you then roll out more widely, actually it's based on informed knowledge and learning and that won't be the same the same size fits all right across the country and in different schools but actually the role of piloting I think has a, has a real advantage in actually enabling people to, to, to learn and then that learning to be shared more widely. Ms Mason do you have any comment? Uh, just in terms of teacher buy-in one of the things that we found effective in our work and that our partners in other countries have found effective is is coming back to this fact which I mentioned before which is that it's the, it's the interaction between teachers and pupils in the classroom that can have the, the, you know, the biggest effect on pupil outcomes. So you find yourselves in a position where it's teachers who can make the biggest difference. And I think although um, some of the practices that, uh, and some of the interventions you know, that we've worked in, they, they could be viewed on as top down, but once you focus on this fact that it's, the evidence shows that it's teachers who can make the difference, that tends to be a really good starting point for a collaborative um, a, you know, collaborative approach and sort of shared responsibility for progress. Okay, thank you very much, Liz. Uh, thank you. Convener, um, just to help us understand the context a bit better, Mr Lennon, could you expand on what you think were the factors at play that moved us from general agreement about the direction of Scottish education into uh, more conformity and less appreciation, perhaps, of diversity and the, the issues. Why have we got into this lockstep, which doesn't seem to be doing much good? I, I think there's a paradox here. I think the consensus and the high level of consensus that resulted prior to the implementation phase of curriculum for excellence, so before 2010, there was such uniformity and such a consensus about the direction that the Scottish curriculum should go in and the fact that it should not be legislatively backed. Here I'd like to pay tribute to the MSPs who, when the Parliament was first open, I thought we were going to get 
nothing but legislation on the school curriculum, given the, the significance. But in fact, that hasn't happened. We don't have a legislative like that curriculum. So there's a great willingness, I think, across the profession to accept the general direction of it. And that, I think, carried us through quite a, a difficult period in terms of funding. A, a reform on that scale should have had far more funding, frankly, than it did. And it, and it coincided with the financial crash uh, and so on. And, and no one really blamed the Education Scotland or the government for that. We just kind of got on with it. I think what has happened then, I was a head teacher throughout this period, of course, um, and it did seem to me that whatever criticisms one might have had at school level, it was v one was very reluctant, certainly as a head teacher, to voice them for fear of jeopardising the general flow. There was a sense that we, we did not want to um, you know, contradict or in any way upset the general thinking on curriculum for excellence. So lot, we simply put up with a lot of things. But I think, frankly, the way it was managed um, at the implementation phase, where every time there was any kind of concern detected in the system, we got another 10,000 pages worth of guidance. It, it was simply very poor management, I think. And again, I'm not trying to blame anyone. That seems to me to be what has happened. But that did lead to, throughout the implementa implementation period, a sense of we'll just have to put up with it. So how many subjects were we going to? offer, given the number of hours per course that the SQA were, as it were, um, stipulating. Although I, did, I do think they were given a brief, which they worked to. I, I'm, I'm a bit less inclined to criticise the SQA, quite frankly, f at, at that stage. I think the thinking about how many hours the na new national exams should take or it could have been better handled. Uh, but we ended up with a kind of arithmetical division of the total number of hours in a school year by, you know, the number of hours in a course, and you end up with five or six. In other words, you have the same number of subjects in fourth year as you have in fifth year because they, they, they specified the same length of time for national fives as they did for higher. And that was clearly a mistake, looking back on it. Um, but I do think it's unfortunate that that um, consensus did not allow honest, reflective criticism to emerge. And that was partly because, as is always the case, and it was certainly the case you know, in my last six years as a head teacher, where the imminence of an HMI inspection you know, figured fairly largely in one's mind. So the idea that you would do anything different from what, was, what appeared to be the consensus was quite tricky. In fact, we did, you know, in my school, did do things a bit differently. We made sure we offered seven subjects, but that required quite a bit of self-confidence and a degree of risk, as it were, because parents are very conscious of that. Uh, we've got to a stage now, I think, where we could be doing with far more open criticism. Could I just pursue that point, Mr Lennon, because I think it's a very interesting one and it fits what you said in your uh, paper here about the conflict between autonomy and the sort of structures that are top down. And I think that's what we're going to have to wrestle with as a committee is the sort of central issue about this governance reform. To what extent do we move to an autonomy um, system for head teachers, but without uh, all the structures that go around that where it has been very top down? And I entirely agree with your um, comments about uh, the way it was led. But that raises another question. I if we don't ha have these structures, that would mean really very considerable autonomy and diversity within the system. Do you, do you think that that, is, um, that that would be predicated on the head teacher's charter being perhaps the first thing that the governance reforms attended to in order to give heads the confidence to be able to lead and to make changes and to perhaps be more critical, self-critical of their own school in a way that you suggest hasn't happened? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a genuinely complex question. You know, I, I'm not in favour of mind giving heads in that sense, telling them this is, you now have confidence. I don't think it can be mandated in that kind of way. But I do think the direction of travel ought to be clearly signposted. And I regard the head teacher's charter, charter as a major step in that direction. But I do understand the complexity of what happens at local authority level or now at regional level. It's not at all clear to me 
whether the removal of the local authority improvement plan, which is what all schools currently first and foremost align with, they have a sense of the national improvement framework and so on. If that goes, what authority do the regional leads in the regional improvement collaboratives have over individual head teachers? If they decide, if the heads decide one thing and it doesn't quite fit, well, you know, to whom do the regional leads report? I mean, I know they report to the new chief inspector, um, but it does seem to me unclear what their relationship will be to individual head teachers who are working to a charter. So that needs cleared up, I think. Could, can I ask you one final point on this? What relationship do you think there ought to be between Education Scotland and the regional collaboratives? The regional collaboratives? Um, frankly, it's not the critical relationship. The, the track record of, of Education Scotland recently um, suggests that, it, that they ought to be a bit more focused on schools. You know, the idea that Education Scotland focuses its attention on the government because the government is the customer, as it were, I think has been part of the problem we've had. So the, whatever role Education Scotland have, my concern would be as a former head, is that it doesn't interfere with innovation at school level, genuine innovation. And I think we could trust schools a lot more to genuinely innovate if we reduced some of the guidance or accountability that's required of them. I mean, it is interesting to me that, for example, the, the, the recent move in the direction of more autonomy for schools um, has been hedged about with so much guidance that we're not entirely sure whether it's worked or not. The, the pupil equity funding is full of accountability. Head teachers are constantly, I mean, and I say constantly, two or three times a term, producing paperwork to account for what they've done with the money to the local authority. Some local authorities have set up additional boards to monitor it. Um, so what should have been a tremendous freedom for head teachers is in fact hedged about by all sorts of concerns about whether they'll spend the money appropriately or not. And I think that's part of the difficulty with the role of Education Scotland. I think we've, as, as a head, certainly throughout the, the period of implementation of Curriculum for Excellence, um, you know, I, I didn't find them particularly helpful at any level. So I'm sceptical about whether structurally Education Scotland can be reformed sufficiently to improve that relationship with schools. I think it may well be stuck with a quasi-government role where it's constantly looking to... I don't know. I mean, I'm, I greatly welcome the appointment of the new chief executive of um, uh, Education Scotland. She may well change the culture and may well take it in a different direction, but the evidence so far uh, doesn't lead me to be very optimistic about Thank you. Week, so we've got the opportunity to ask them about the future direction. Uh, Daniel, do you want to come in about the cultural change? Uh, I, I mean, I, I think you, you, you... Well, I, I mean, I guess you, you, you've more or less answered the question. I just thought about Education Scotland and its role, so no... Tavish and then Joanne. I wonder if I could um, thank you, Kavina, ask about the point you're, you've both been making um, uh, on primaries versus secondaries. Um, would you elaborate on the arguments why uh, they should be considered to be uh, dealt with separately? Um, I suppose my observation is that, I, that all bar two of the primary heads in my constituency teach. So quite when they find time to do anything else is quite beyond me. But I'd rather you gave it some intellectual clarity to that. Precisely the issue. The level of flexibility for leadership and management at a primary schools is much more constrained. I mean, one, one staff absence can remove uh, a head, well, not remove a head, but if a head has to cover usually herself or an absent teacher, it, it, it kind of run a coach and horses through the idea that head teachers are there to lead learning and develop and support staff, where all you're doing is plugging gaps in the cover. So I do think that's a fundamental difference. But I think the, the, the other difference is that the range of leadership posts, and this is why management structures are so important in the head teacher's charter. The head teacher's charter will give individual heads the right to design their own leadership structure within the budget, although what the overall budget is and how it's determined you know, remains to be seen. But if there is, an, if there is a defined overall budget, and the primary head, for example, of a relatively small school is allowed to design it. Well, how, how are you going to require her or him to define a promoted structure if it's largely dependent on 
covering for absent colleagues in the course of the year. And the amount of flexibility it would have to put into that budget to guarantee that, I think, in some small primaries, would be absolutely enormous. You'd be doubling their budgets. So what would be the best reform in this area? It would be to take secondaries and, and let them develop in the ways in which you've all been describing? Well, I, I, that was my inclination. I don't know enough about the primary sector from personal experience. So it's all anecdotal, um, I, I suppose. But having worked with, you know, several... Um, primary heads over the course of being a head teacher of a secondary school, it does seem to me that the secondary sector, sector is more, certainly more amenable. It may well be more important to provide more autonomy at the secondary level. By and large, primary schools, it does seem to me, um, in, certainly in Scotland, do a pretty good job. I think secondary schools do as well, but there's more scope for real improvement, as we all know, looking at some of the, the statistics from the lower school. But the issues do, do seem to me to be similar in the sense that if you give more control to the head teacher, you'll give more control to learning and teaching, and therefore pedagogy, and therefore culture change. But it will be expensive, and it will be very expensive in primary schools, where they don't have the same efficiencies of scale. Thank you. Do our other witnesses have a view about this, this important distinction between primary schools and secondaries? Not in terms of the specifics, but I think the points about capacity and capability um, are, are well made and the resourcing that might be required around that. Yeah, so uh, again, I'm not an expert in these particular reforms, but um, uh, the work that we've done, uh, trials in schools, projects in schools, capacity, you know, I don't need to say it, is a, is a massive issue. And one of the main reasons that we find that things don't work and aren't implemented well is because there isn't the time and there isn't the capacity for teachers to... Um, step outside the standard classroom activity and, you know, get involved in CPD and innovation and change. So absolutely, I take the point on that, and there needs to be capacity in the primary sector. But I suppose the thing to stand against that is that uh, the job that we want to do and the narrowing of the gap between disadvantaged pupils and other pupils, that, need, that does need to start in primary. We can't wait until well, all the evidence that we have on interventions that start at secondary school is that I don't want to say it's too late, but you don't want to start then. You don't want to start at 10 or 11. You want to start as early as possible. Thank you, Joanne. Yeah, and then, Joanne. I, I mean, I, I would like to ask later about definitions of autonomy and the role of head teachers on, but I just want to particularly ask uh, Danielle Mason. You said the most important thing was interaction between teachers and pupils. You might argue there's an issue about what the pupils bring to the classroom with them as well as what the teacher brings and the challenges in some places. But I wonder... Have you thought then about the extent to which the autonomy should um, rest with the individual teacher as opposed to the head teacher? I mean, it does, where I came from in education, I suppose I was at the bottom of a very top down structure as a classroom teacher. And while we hear a lot of the language around autonomy, it seems to settle at head teacher level. I wonder if there's any evidence around the degree of autonomy that individual classroom teachers should have. So I don't know of any evidence specifically of the impact of allocating autonomy at different levels of the school teacher and, and the impact that that's been shown to have. But in terms of our experience of working with teachers um, and the different types of interventions we look at and the impact they have, there is this group where there's just no way that you're going to make change without having teachers on board. And obviously teachers already have a lot of autonomy in the classroom. What they choose to do and the way they choose to interact with their pupils is you know, going to be hugely significant in whether or not teaching and learning is effective in their classroom. So I think it's about... So that autonomy already exists, whether you like it or not, even if you wanted the most top-down system in the world. So I suppose it's about combining that with then another level of interactions, which are really about head teacher responsibility rather than individual teacher responsibility. So what we, we talk to heads and we talk to teachers, and what we try and do is demonstrate that so many of the interventions that make a difference are either the responsibility of teachers or the responsibility of heads. I suppose it's trying to empower a profession to say that you have decision-making powers, whether you're a head or a teacher, which make a genuine difference to, to, to the outcomes of pupils. Definitely, when we talk about secondary education, there's an intermediate level, which is at subject level. And if you, you might argue that in terms of um, actual education within the classroom, that relationship is more significant than a head teacher in a large secondary school who may have overall responsibility 
but actually won't necessarily be the person who's in a position to direct um, round the quality of teaching within a subject? Is there an argument for autonomy at subject level? Yeah, absolutely, but I, I'm, not, I'm not the best person to, you, to decide whether or not those things need to be legislative. I suppose what you want is a culture of autonomy within the school and the head teacher charter can be the sort of the driving force behind that and then one of the things that that you would hope an autonomous um an autonomous teacher with access to good evidence and good continuous professional development and the tools that they need to support them then brings the whole school into that at the necessary levels so you've got head teacher you've got subject leaders you know, there are many other senior leaders in the school who have decision-making powers which are important for deciding which interventions are going to make a difference to pupil learning. This is the argument around autonomy to teach a shorthand for taking decision-making into schools as opposed to there is a person who gets autonomy and then directs what happens within their schools. So I suppose there's a difference between the autonomy and the accountability. Um, there's, there's obvious arguments for having clear line of accountability, but in terms of autonomy, uh, autonomy over your practice, empowerment of you as a professional, that it seems to me that has to go throughout the school, not just be about a single individual. Thank you. Thank you. It comes down to, to matters of leadership as well. It's not just actually about the responsibilities, it's how those responsibilities are exercised. And you'd expect, I would imagine, the head teacher to be engaging with teachers, with parents and with learners. So they might, I think that distinction between autonomy and responsibility is important. They might have the, the accountability rather, um, but that doesn't mean it's not exercised through engagement with other people. Okay, thank you very much. Joanne? Yeah, I'm very interested in picking up on the idea of piloting um, schemes. Um, is there merit in being a little bit bold, or in fact, very a lot bold, and piloting different methods in different areas and then looking, analysing the results? I'm thinking about some of... Um, I mentioned this last week to the panel. I'm thinking of schools, secondary schools and primary schools that work in very close partnership with one another are the ones that I'm always most impressed with. The ones where you've maybe got secondary school pupils, maybe in subject areas, being involved in the primary teaching, maybe in languages or, or, or getting involved. So there's that kind of flow between the two uh, tiers of school. Um, and is there merit in looking at different um, methods of work of, of, of clusters Targeting areas maybe where attainment hasn't been particularly good and trying some new models and being bold with that and then almost like reporting back. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. Um, I say particularly if the evidence base is contested or incomplete or we're doing new things that might not have been tried before and, and seldom will we know all the answers before we do something. It's, you know, it's, it's not a perfect world. So trying out different things in different areas, particularly if you can get some degree of comparability about some of the challenges or the structures that already exist. Um, it, and it doesn't always need to be set up. It could be natural experiments where you've already got um, things working differently in different areas and you can compare and contrast and you set some controls around around the parameters for that but I think that does enable better and greater learning if you can look at what's worked somewhere and what maybe has been less successful somewhere else and actually then share that learning and think about actually then how you adapt your approach going forward in areas that have similar characteristics so I, I certainly think there's a lot to be said for that approach. We should be a little bit more relaxed about the risk involved maybe something's not working but learning from them and I, I think that's absolutely critical. I mean, it's critical this whole debate, actually building in that learning culture and that learning culture at all levels. So actually something not being as effective as, as you might have thought it or wanted it to be and not achieving its outcomes. As long as there's learning from that, as long as uh, um, mechanisms are being set in place to evaluate it from the start, and as long as it's you know, not reckless, it's a calculated risk, because I think otherwise you don't get innovation. But that does require a maturity at all levels around actually being prepared for things not to work and then to amend and change them without them being seen as a U-turn or things like that. So there's a, there's a culture there that's required in terms of actually how that learning is responded to. But there's a real risk of a fear of failure that then prohibits innovation. So, I mean, I think piloting really has a role to play in that. I think it's, it's extremely important to think about um, 
designing that well. So is it, there are many ways um, which can be relatively inexpensive and, and, and relatively straightforward to learn from piloting. But there are countless examples of governments piloting, innovating and not learning because they haven't laid the groundwork for understanding how you evaluate the impact of something. So um, it sounds like a great idea to learn from pilots, but absolutely, you know, make sure that what is built into that is real learning of, of impact and the cause and effect of this type of partnership and this type of outcome. So that's essential. Which means it's really important actually identifying right from the start is what are the outcomes that are trying to be achieved and what is the data that's required to be collected in order to be able to determine whether or not that has happened. What piloting isn't is doing things in a few places and then rolling it out more widely unless you've actually learned from actually what's happened within that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Oliver, you were going to go on to governance and outcomes if you want to. Sort, sort of convener, but I was also probably yeah. going to link back to a couple yeah. of things yeah. uh, we've heard already. Uh, one of the things I hear from teachers in my constituency, not dissimilar to the points that Tavish Scott made, was around sort of smaller rural primary schools. A number of them don't receive any pupil equity funding at the moment because of uh, how, how the funding uh, formula for that has, has been worked out. And particularly those, those sort of teachers uh, do, do worry about the flexibility and this idea that you know, if governance reform goes ahead as proposed, you know, good schools that have flexibility will see an improvement and those who are already struggling or have limited flexibility could actually go backwards uh, or that that attainment gap uh, for their pupils could, could actually widen. Uh, do, you th do you think that that is a, is, is a realistic possibility? First of all, the, the governance is not going to close the attainment gap. You know, one, no one thing will close the attainment ga gap. But if we are seriously concerned about developing the Scottish education system and the quality of education right across the four capacities, as it were, then we ought to be open to flexible forms of governance. And that's basically all the Commission School Reform has been arguing for. We're not saying we should scrap the current system and introduce a new one, lockstep, as it were. The argument is a bit more sophisticated than that. It's to take account of the nature of schools as they are and their capacity, but also, crucially, how they see themselves. And it may well be that some schools need to be encouraged to see themselves as much more effective than they possibly feel currently. They may have greater capacities than they are aware of. Now, that's a certain possibility. But changes in governance, such as putting schools or allowing schools to form their own clusters, there are plenty of, of secondaries with, um, as, as you know, it's just been mentioned, with very good working relationships with clusters that could be built on and developed. But there's nothing to stop, say, an individual secondary school. The problem with a, a cluster around a secondary school is what clusters the secondary school in. You need a secondary school network as well. But none of this is, um, you know, none of this is out with the bounds of possibility. I just feel that the, at the moment, as it's set up, the head teacher charter looks to me as though it's a kind of lockstep approach. Everyone at a particular, driven by a timetable that's not the schools and probably not even any of the current local authorities. So the, the, the idea that we should be looking at individual circumstances and allowing schools far higher levels of participation in that decision making um, seems to me to be crucial. That's the kind of thing that might change the culture. And I do think creating a, 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 an, um, an embedded learning culture at management and leadership level in schools is as important as at, at teacher level. Teachers are very predisposed to reflecting on their own work and being self-critical and so on, but not if they think they're going to be rated on it every two weeks or every term or whatever. And so changing the culture to allow people to make mistakes without their professional reputation being impugned applies equally to schools, I think. And I think we should be signalling up at this point in Scottish education a, a change of culture for the profession and not just focus on you know, the, the, the idea it would be better for everyone to have more autonomy. Okay, does anyone else have any further comments? Or um, The sort of second question was you obviously hinted, or sort of more strongly than hinted, uh, about problems with the implementation around curriculum for 
uh, excellence. Uh, do you think that, that those issues are sufficiently resolved to sort of allow, a, you know, enough trust to have been built up with teachers to take forward governance changes at this time? I, th I think the jury's still out on that one, quite frankly. I think the, the experience of Curriculum for Excellence um, was so bruising for schools that some of the damage done there may well be irreparable. I don't know. I would, ho I would hope not. I certainly think that the, the current proposals signal up an intention nationally to do something about it. So what we're arguing about is not that, you know, we want, no one's arguing for the status quo, at least I hope not. The, 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 the idea is what would be the best way forward. And my view certainly is that it should be a consensual way forward, but that shouldn't allow, that shouldn't forbid rigorous debate, which is part of what this committee has so effectively contributed to over the, over the last few years, and particularly scrutiny of curriculum for excellence and the management of it. I do think we're in, and I'm optimistic at the moment, I would think, if, if provided we don't fall into the trap of just mandating everything from the centre to be then policed by Education Scotland and a combination of regional improvement collaboratives and local authorities, we, we may well have the opportunity here to create a, a, a more diverse system that would allow different types of clusters, different types of partnership, and schools would, would feel released to be creative. I think there's a huge pent-up potential in schools that's been held back by fear of failure, you know, compliance with local authority. I mean, some local authorities have given point systems to schools to to make sure they all have the same leadership and management structure. In retrospect, that's beginning to sound really bizarre, given the range and diversity of schools. And I think the primary sector has suffered badly from that comparison with secondary schools in their far fewer pro rata, the far fewer promoted leadership roles in primary schools than there are in secondary schools, and they've been reducing it in secondary schools. So if the head teachers had much more authority at school level, I think that's a better guarantee of teacher autonomy than you'll get from something that's mandated through the curriculum. We've tried that and it didn't work with Curriculum for Excellence. My only worry, I suppose, is that Curriculum for Excellence is beginning to sound like an actual curriculum. Um, you know, there, there ought to be opportunities for individual schools, perhaps in individual small primary schools, to deviate from it quite dramatically without being punished, as it were. There ought to be that flexibility in the system, it seems to me. Can I just pick up the culture point? Because um, there, there was a question in the meeting's papers about whether policymakers can, can create culture change. And Frank spoke earlier about the, the culture of compliance. I mean, I, I personally don't feel policymakers in and of themselves can create culture change. But what policymakers and governments can do is, is can create frameworks that support and incentivize that. So if you think of things that I've done to enable things like gay marriage, for example, that supports different attitudes to homosexuality or are more restrictive in terms of things like the smoking ban. But I think it's all part, and going back to the point about trust, it's about developing and delivering policy with rather than done to. I mean, it's a bit of a cliche, but I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an important point. And actually exciting people behind a shared goal and a shared vision um, rather than because of the culture of compliance that, that Frank referred to. But at the end of the day, in terms of trust, I think it has, come to that, come, has to come down to some fairly fundamental um, points about transparency, openness and, and mutual respect. And I think that's how you get trust in a system. And there is some high-quality research evidence about, you know, the best way to implement change. Uh, trust and shared responsibility are key factors there, and, uh, and my organisation is going to be producing some evidence for schools putting this type of thing into practice uh, next year. But So there's evidence to draw on as well. Uh, George? Good morning. Uh, I'd like to ask, I take on board what Frank Lennon said, that governance in itself won't actually uh, bridge the attainment gap. It's a whole basket of measures that are going to do that uh, long term. But what is the role of governments in improving outcomes in for teachers and for in the classroom itself with uh, young people? Is there a role for governments to actually uh, help make things better and drive improvement forward? I certainly think so. I think part of the difficulty currently is that, you know, I mean, a, a teacher knows when there are problems with school leadership, when the only rationale they're given for a policy at school level, a teaching and learning policy, is that the HMI want it, or Education Scotland wants it, or some outside agency that's to whom they feel accountable wants it, or it's 
the local authority have appointed so-and-so to go around schools and check. That's the very worst type of governance. It does seem to me that if creating a situation where schools are genuinely leading the system, I mean, the, the, some of the language in the, the government publication is just wonderful. You know, a teacher-led, school-led system. Um, Decision-makings at school must not be overridden. That word is used in the document. Um, centrally. So there's lots to build on there, and this seem to me it's exactly the right direction. The problem is, and I do think it is a structural problem, I think if you create more autonomy at school level, what you will get by and large is not a series of rogue head teachers out to feather their own nest or you know, develop their own careers. I think what you're more liable to get is a much more close, closely focused school on their intake, on their parents, on the diversity and challenges that their children face. And you'll have far more imagination in how to deploy resources if head teachers feel they are in control of it. And again, it's one of the other paradoxes. We are not going to get collaboration, unless, in my view, unless we have very high levels of autonomy. Mandated collaboration is not collaboration. You know, is it, we have got to encourage. The reason the Northern Alliance worked is precisely because it wasn't mandated from the centre. So we now have a chief inspector that understands that. So there's, you know, there, there, there is every right to be hopeful about the future direction. The worry would be that the regional collaboratives just become another policing measure that local authorities go to head teachers with and say, well, you must have that because it's in the regional plan. Very much in the way they used to say, you have to have that because it's in the authority plan. So that's, that's the difficulty. I think governance can be very intrusive at school level and has been traditionally. And much of it is required. I'm not against, I'm not for a free-for-all as it were, but I do think the level of policy making at a, at a national level has to be much clearer than it has been and that would allow a much wider range of innovation at school level. Come in, George. And this, is, this has been one of the key issues that have been raised by the RSE in, in, in our submissions to date is that not the governance is not important, but actually understanding better the evidence in terms of how changing the governance will lead to, to improved outcomes. Um, and I think that the government has sought to provide more evidence in some of its more recent um, uh, publications, including the, the recent consultation. But I think what would be useful to see is a, a comprehensive review of the evidence base that actually really documents that, that's actually how governance reform can make a difference because I think that would give credibility and, and weight to the proposals and help build support because it would be easier to see exactly what governance changes lead to what improved outcomes and, and how and why they do that. Okay, uh, one of the, so are, are we saying, uh, and, and particularly in Mr Lennon's case, that probably the regional uh, bodies along with the national bodies, probably a flexibility between local, na uh, regional, national then would make it more uh, would make it work better than just actually a, a rigid approach to coming from the, the top. Although we still have national outcomes and we'll still have each region will probably have their outcomes as well. I, I'm still not too clear about that. Personally, I have to say, you know, to whom is the chief inspector reporting? Who's line managing Education Scotland? Still not clear to me. There is some kind of reporting, but is it at the information level? Or is, is there a line management link between the chief inspector and the government? And also, there, there is this residual problem of the inspectorate in Scotland inspecting their own policies. So we're never going to have policy failures in Scotland, if, if that keeps going. Um, and I do think that separation or clarity of role, is, is, that's another structural issue I think needs urgently to be addressed, I would, I would suggest. But I, I, I do think that at school level, a far higher level of autonomy will be self-empowering for individual teachers. And I would think this is probably more true in rural primary schools where they feel dragged by local authority policies into whatever conventions or formula is being used. But at the other end of the scale, you might get much more interesting um, openness about pedagogy that we've frankly not had in Scotland for a long time. It, it's, we've, we've become... A, a profession of bandwagon jumpers, you know, wh whichever comes along, you better jump on it because that's currently what the HMI will be looking for, you know. And I think we need to stop some of that and allow people to try things out, fail, and not be pilloried. Right. Yeah. 
One of the points that you brought up uh, during, uh, you've got four points here which you've gone down, you've told us to break down your belief in the breakdown in political consensus and uh, the culture of compliance, but the uh, systemic leadership weaknesses and uh, the lack of diversity and innovation, you've mentioned it, but you've not really gone on in detail. What exactly uh, do you mean by, you know, can you maybe give me a more detail where you're... Well, I, I, th I think that the lack of diversity, the, the lack of diversity and innovation is evidenced by school structures. We have 358 secondary schools. So m much of what I have to say, I have to say is about secondary here. And, and, and you know, the, the diversity and innovation that I'm thinking about there largely comes from my experience and reading of you know, the last few years uh, about where we are. It's remarkable to me, given the diversity of Scottish schools, that virtually every state-run secondary school in Scotland is led and managed in exactly the same way. They will have proportionately the same number of deputies, probably with similar remits. They will have accountability systems at school level that are pretty much the same. And so going to staff development courses or sending staff to staff development courses, they basically come back with stuff that you're already doing or people think they're already doing. And finding or hearing of something that's genuinely innovative is problematic. And that's partly because local authorities, for, reason, for reasons of equality, don't want one school looking very different from another. And so I understand all of that because they're responsible for all of their schools. But say, for example, you wanted to double the number of principal teachers of pastoral care in a school, right? A local authority could quite easily say, no, the norm for a school of your size is three, and that's all, you, that's all you're allowed. The head teacher charter does away with that. A school can say, no, in this school, we want 12 PT1s instead of three principal teacher salary points, PT6s or whatever, still within the same budget. Until the head teacher charter, no head teacher could guarantee that they had that authority. And that's what I mean by lack of diversity. And that if you get that diversity into the school structure system, it will have a knock-on effect inevitably on the climate in the school, and I think you'll get genuine innovation at pedagogical level. There's plenty of teachers that are innovative in the classroom, of course, and many of them um, will now be picking up on the, the educational endowment toolkit that's been developed. But that's been around for, what, eight years? It's, you know, it's almost as if, and I've been looking at it as I had teachers since about 2008, well, eight, nine. But it's suddenly arrived. It's suddenly new in Scotland. You know, I'm delighted that Danielle's here. But that... But that kind of mechanism has just not been part of our culture because it's too innovative and it doesn't have an HMI imprimatur on it. And in fact, we have to have a Scottish version of it, not just for reasons of alignment, but because it's got to be Scottish before anyone will really look at it. Can I ask a quick question just to follow on from what Oliver said? Uh, it was in general last week, uh, Keir Bloomer uh, told us that, you know, it wasn't so much uh, uh, how much money you spent, it was how you spent it and where you spent it. And one of the debates that we have is that the SIMD is quite a, uh, some would say crude measurement in areas like mine and Paisley, it probably is pretty accurate. But in Oliver and Tavish's area, it's probably doesn't find, uh, doesn't find a way to find where rural poverty is. You know, uh, now, it's currently all we seem to have. Keir mentioned last week the possibility of free school meals. I read the Royal Society's paper on it as well, and they didn't really come up with anything to say what is another way of doing it. You know, are, are there other ways we're looking at trying to identify that data, get that data and get the money into the right? As Keir Bloomer quite rightly says, you know, the, uh, the amounts of money, it's not so much the amounts, it's getting the right money in at the right time, at the right place. The Commission on Widening Access, the Government's Commission on Widening Access, recommended looking at a, a, a unique learner number. And I do understand that some work has been done within government to be, begin to sort of explore the feasibility of that. Um, it's not that SIMD shouldn't be, shouldn't be used at all, but it needs to be used with individual level based data. So I think, you know, if, if there is work ongoing to look at a, a unique learner number, it would be certainly worth um, exploring that further. Yeah, I absolutely agree on that. The, um, Area deprivation is, is not a great measure for identifying sp individual need. You know, the majority of deprived children do not live in deprived areas. I used to work on the index of multiple deprivation um, back in the day. Um, so it is important that you find a more, you know, a, a, a more individually targeted way to make sure that uh, 
children in particular areas that aren't that deprived, you know, don't miss out. And, and it's not insignificant. I mean, in our paper, uh, uh, you've seen that uh, we reckon we're missing about a third of the deprived children if we just use SIMD, and actually we're including a quarter of children who are not deprived. Then Tavish I, just, I just wanted to make the point, because I feel quite strongly about this, that there are impacts within communities of there being a lot of deprivation within a community, not just for the individuals who are themselves deprived, but the impact it has on a school and its capacity to deliver anything is affected by the fact that three quarters of the children are deprived, not that a quarter of them aren't. All of the services in that community are affected by the fact there is a, um, a density of deprivation within communities. And I, I wonder whether that's recognised as a balance. I get the individual argument, but anybody's taught in a school where there's you know, a significant proportion of the children are deprived, you know it's not just an impact on them, it's an impact on the other young people in the school as well. At the individual level, then you're recognising that density of deprivation within the school. So if you do have three quarters or half of the young people in a school who are deprived, you recognise that density at the individual level. For example, the capacity to teach a child who's, who's coping very well might want to do five hires. The chances are their ability to get the quality of education to get them five hires is going to be affected by other choices because the quarters of the kids have got... Other, it's not that there's not lots of bright children there, but the impacts on their lives, it's not just them and their families, but everybody within that community. And that's, you know, the idea that somebody's de developed SIMD because they don't want to do the hard work of finding out where poor children are living, I think it's missing the point. But it is the impact on services more generally in areas where there's a density of poverty. I think I made the point that it's, it's not that you don't use SIMD at all. I mean, I don't think anyone's saying you don't use SIMD at all, but you supplement it with unique learner data. And it will depend on, the, you know, what you're trying to achieve and how you're trying to achieve it and actually what you're trying to measure. Um, but in terms of uh, unique learner numbers, as, as Danielle says, allows you to look at school level as well to see actually how it plays out in terms of individual deprivation. Thank you. Thank you. Tavish? Yeah, just a brief supplementary to George Adams' very fair question about Education Scotland earlier. Um, Mr Lennon, um, you've, your paper is very clear about your concerns about Education Scotland as currently constituted, and you've, made, you've just given us the view that uh, inspection and, and policy should be separated. I mean, apart from that point, which is uh, pretty fundamental, what should Education Scotland's actual role be in the future? Well, it does seem to me that this is quite a difficult one structurally, I think, but if, the, if schools are to lead the system, then Education Scotland should serve the schools. So schools should, as it were, so there's an additional responsibility coming schools' way and teachers' way, if, if that is the, the case. I think at the moment, the, the problem has been that in the management, the six years of management of curriculum for excellence, Education Scotland was seen as, as it were, keeping the, the train on the tracks, but, but not really doing anything about the quality of the carriages or whatever the metaphor may be, I don't know. And I think we really do need to, to turn that around a wee bit. Schools need to be much more focused on the curriculum and seek advice from. It tends not to have happened in the past where a school that goes to another agency to seek advice is, admission, is, is, is admitting failure. And so there's a reluctance, cultural reluctance there. And I, so I don't blame Education Scotland entirely for that kind of conundrum. But I do think there is an opportunity to now to try and do it. Now, it, it may well be that regional collaboratives will work, but it certainly seems to me that if we're going to improve the quality of learning and teaching, then it has to be done through staff development. And it's schools that know which staff need developed and where. And the issue about subject development is, it, it, it is a particular issue in secondary schools, obviously, if there are um, relatively few subject specialists in a particular school, how do they get their um, professional development. We have to find a way, and it, and it ought not to be out with the, the wit of our professional community, to come up with a system that empowers the schools to seek advice on, or as part of a cluster, or as part of a, a network, to seek advice on X, Y, and Z. The worry is that everything is initiated by Education Scotland, and it's then evaluated by Education Scotland. Thank you. Convener, it's already been mentioned that genuine empowerment, particularly at primary level, is expensive um, and that a number of the issues with the implementation of curriculum for excellence were either compounded by or in some cases created as a result of that happening at the same time as some quite significant budget cuts. My concern is that regardless of the specifics of uh, these structural reform proposals, whether they're right or wrong, 
Um, I'm wondering, is any set of such fundamental reform destined not to succeed if it takes place at a time of continued significant budget cuts? If, if any change this drastic is not resourced, what chance does it actually have of succeeding? And will any potential failure be put down to, will the reasoning behind it, the conventional wisdom be that structural reform is a mistake or will people be able to correctly identify that it was a result of budget cuts, not any inherent issues with the proposals? I mean, I think that's a key question to some extent and it, it, it's exemplified perhaps by the requirement in the head teacher's charter that heads appoint every member of staff to their school. Now, the issue of, that obviously arises is if a school role is declined and someone is declared surplus and a head in that particular authority chooses not to employ that person, there has to be some, and it will have to be some kind of financial mechanism to allow that to continue. So there's one of the issues about this. I, I, part of the difficulty with the implementation of curriculum for excellence, I think, was, was precisely that it, that it did take place at a time of drastically shrinking local authority budgets. And I think that, although there, you know, there, there, there was resource available where it needed to be available, it's, the schools were constantly being asked to cut staff. And it's just about the only way you can save money in a school now is really from your staffing budget. That's, you know, th that dominates the 2% of the budget the head teachers have control of. But I do think this is a bit of, a, bit of a worry because if the, the, the funding of schools probably needs to be a um, much clearer the formula um, that's used or whatever the mechanism is used to decide the budget has to be in the public domain and open to scrutiny it seems to me um, in order to make clear where the issues may arise and I think there is obviously talk going on at the moment about fair funding for schools but it may well be that the success or otherwise of the governance review uh, falls down on funding I think this really depends on of obviously on on how the how the reforms are impl implemented so you know in in the consultation documents it's very clear that this is not intended to be an extra layer of bureaucracy and demands on schools and if we can if it's possible to manage that so that rather than being an extra layer of demands this is freedom to focus on the things that are most effective and most cost effective then a time of tight budgets is you know, it's the time when you need to do that kind of thing. Identify the things you're doing in your school that don't work and generally aren't effective and focus money, resources, capacity on the things that have been shown to be most cost effective in improving outcomes. I mean, a, a theme at both today's session and last week's session, I think, was all about capacity and capability. And in terms of ensuring you have sufficient capacity and capability, I think there's a, there's a number of dimensions to that, one of which might be funding. Though I think the point Daniel makes is, is, is well made, but it is also the time question as well. And, and because actually that will depend on actually how much capacity and capability people have, have got to bring to bear on something. And, uh, Dr. Winterfield, you mentioned um, and quite correctly the, the contested evidence in this area. There's a recent paper by the Government's Council of Education Advisors um, that stated their belief based on the evidence that culture and, and capacity were the most significant issues. That seemed to chime more with the response from the teaching workforce as well as parents, pupils, etc., to the Government's initial consultation on this. Is there a danger that regardless of whether reforms are correct or not, that trying to implement them in the face of what is really quite significant and strong opposition, particularly from your teaching workforce, what are the, the dangers of, of trying to implement that in the face of, of such opposition being unable to carry that workforce with you because they don't believe their primary concern has been addressed? Well, the way to do it is incrementally. I mean, what you're describing is effectively a scenario where everyone does it, whether they want it or not. The, you know, the argument that I would certainly offer is don't do it that way. You know, find those areas, and there may be, they may be significant, we just don't know, where there would be genuine enthusiasm and willingness to go and do it that way and remove the time scale. The time scale seems to me to be part of the difficulty. The idea that by the end of this parliament, parliament there has to be a set of statistics that show narrowing or closing is a pressure on schools that they could do without. 
the point about the evidence base as well. I think if, if there could be a clear articulation of the evidence base around some of this, I mean, it's not the only way, but it's a way of actually um, getting a greater credibility and support for those proposals for, for people who might be opposed to it because actually they don't know what the evidence is saying in terms of how effective or otherwise changes changes might be. Um, but there, will, there, will, there is always resistance to change. You know, any sort of major change program has some resistance, and, and then it's actually comes back again to points about trust and respect and transparency in the way that the process is done, uh, not just what's done. Thank you. Just uh, a couple of uh, questions, one of which perhaps follows up uh, Ross Greer's question. In terms of workload, uh, I think Danielle's comments were that you think there's a potential to lighten teachers' workload because one of the big issues that we, we uh, hear about as MSPs is, is teachers' workload in our local schools. So these reforms hopefully will provide an opportunity to lessen teacher workload. And I just want to know if that's your view as well. well it very much depends on, on how they're implemented and how the different governance structures and relationships work. But certainly our experience is that that's a that's a huge issue for teachers as well. And that there definitely are ways to improve performance at the same time as reducing workload. So th um, just to give one example, there are lots of marking practices at the moment which teachers find very resource intensive, which have no evidence behind them whatsoever. So you know, um, we produced a report basically looking into the evidence on that and, and so stopping doing things that there's no evidence for or even in some cases that are shown to be harmful and putting more resource and time into things that are known to be effective. It's, it sounds simple, it takes, you know, it, it takes strategy from ahead and buy-in from teachers but there are ways to make things better at the same time as reducing workload, it can be done. Okay. Any other comments? I just think that to add <clears throat> we're having this debate over the education reforms in Parliament and throughout the education community in Scotland, but one way in which teachers themselves in the classroom will judge the success of the reforms is the impact on their workload. I just wondered if you had that. Teachers complain about their workload. They complain about the pointlessness of a lot of their workload. And I think that's part of the difficulty. Teachers don't resent working hard. And I think what, what really exacerbates a teacher's working life is that much of their time is spent doing, often it's pointless bureaucracy, masquerading as some kind of quality assurance, which they then have to repeatedly do. But I think, again, you know, far more control at school level where we say, well, we're not going to do that, or looking for precisely the kind of advice that the Education well, Endowment Foundation can provide and looking in detail at it and having the confidence to say, well, we will stop doing this would be a would be a, a, a definite way of making um, or taking things forward. But I do think the, the, the worry I would have about it is that we talk about the workload as if it was a uniform thing. And, and I do think that there are schools and there are individual departments where I'm quite sure that where, where teachers work as hard as any others but don't feel that they are oppressed in the way that some others because of the nature of the of the culture of the environment that they're in. So I think I would be for being a bit more specific about um, looking at teacher workload. Yeah. And final question is sorry, in terms just, of... Sorry, just sorry, just two, two quick points in relation to that. I mean, I think one is about not seeing the governance reforms just just as a, as a sort of um, standalone uh, intervention. There's also the other initiatives and interventions that, that are going on across the education system, and those will all come together at different ways and, and play out in different ways. The other point about, um, you, you know, stopping doing things the only caveat i would make to do to, to that is but you often need to invest time in order to be able to save time because you need to be able to have that time and capacity to step back to look at the evidence base to see what's working and then make some decisions about actually stopping doing things yeah. okay my final question is very parochial it relates to my constituency of murray in that we have some well publicized challenges facing our schools in murray at the moment and one of which is the shortage of teachers, and particularly the shortage of supply teachers, which is putting huge pressure on the current workforce. And I wonder to what extent some of those issues relate to the fact it's a small education authority. And this in turn links into the debate we're having here about regional collaboration, as well as more autonomy to schools. So how do these two themes that are surrounding the education reform debate impact on small education authorities? And do you think 
that Murray being a small education authority is a factor in some of the, not necessarily distinctive challenges, but very much big challenges that are, are facing our schools at the moment, Murray? Well, it, well, it could be. I mean, uh, um, I, I've not taught in a, a, a particularly small uh, authority, but I, but I understand the issues. Mm -hmm. The flexibility that exists currently, for, for example, between primary and secondary schools to share staff is very, very limited. And I would hope that in a kind of paradoxical way, some reform of the GTC might loosen up some of these arrangements and make some of the, the demands for cover a bit more um, manageable. Uh, now, I'm, I'm pretty sure the professional associations will be very alert to this, this kind of thing. But, for example, in a cluster where you have seven or eight primary schools and a secondary school or whatever, there might be more flexibility, even in a small authority, to operate some of the personnel issues holistically than constantly having to worry about the individual um, institution. And that kind of innovation, I think, might come with some of the structural changes, but also with the, the look at the Education Workforce Council. OK, thank you. Uh, Daniel? Um, if I can paraphrase, uh, par paraphrase, that's a new word, paraphrase a little bit some of the things that have been discussed. I mean, it, it, what I've heard is that the increasing autonomy is a sort of a, a necessary condition, but not necessarily sufficient, and sort of collaboration is the other critical factor. Um, and, and last week, I, I spent a bit of time asking around kind of the, the OECD comment about strengthening the middle. I mean, do you think that is what is required in order to bring about that collaboration? And, and do, you think there's a, do you think there's enough focus on that from the, the governance review as it stands at the moment? And if not, what, what would you like to see in terms of that strengthening the middle? And I put that to Frank and Danielle, I think, primarily. Yeah, I, I'm not so sure about it. I mean, I think the regional collab collaboratives could become weakening the middle because you could have another layer of accountability. So that's the danger of them. The intention to share expertise across a wider base is entirely laudable, and there is some evidence in, from the Northern Challenge that that, that did work. So, the, so I suppose the answer is, yes, we do need to do something about strength, strengthening the middle, but I don't think it should be at the expense of back to the school autonomy, but I think if you don't have a high level of school input into that middle area, um, we won't have moved forward significantly. We look at in my organisation is how you um, put evidence into practice, and you know one of the th our experiences that teachers listen to other teachers. So something that we're doing at the moment in England is setting up a, a network of research schools for sort of sharing of best practice, but just to be clear, you know, evidence-based best practice. So I think we definitely have recognised the need as an organisation for a layer above school where there can be shared learning and collaboration and sharing of evidence. So I don't know, I know there's a lot of discussion about definition of the middle and you know, I, don't, I, you know, I don't want to wade into that, but certainly there's value in having the space somewhere to have that uh, shared experiences and, and shared learning above the single school level. So, so is that about making sure that the re regional improvement collaboratives are accountable downwards it, as much as they're accountable upwards uh, and, and also does that not also have a, a clear implication in terms of the, the the consultation around funding mechanisms as well because that that will regardless of how you you state things should be uh, ultimately behavior follows the money well i think they one of the things that they could be is an opportunity to provide that space for, for shared learning, high quality focused collaboration. And there are obviously many things that they could do, and we've talked about some of the things they could do that would be unhelpful, but to provide a space for high quality collaboration with a focus on outcomes and improving the quality of teaching and learning, so school focused, teacher focused, you know, that would be a valuable contribution at that level. Uh, can I finally ask, so there's been an awful lot of discussion um, from all the panellists about the, the role of, of evidence um, and, 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 and demonstrating that. Do, do you think a, a component of this governance review needs to actually be how, how we evidence things, how we 
you know, how we demonstrate, how we use evidence and build evidence. And uh, one sort of supplementary to that is, do we need to have a, another look at kind of what international measures we are, are using and what role they play? And in particular, think about the ones we do use, uh, uh, you know, PISA and the ones that we, we don't, which Pearl and Tim's. So I'll, I'll, I'll let Rebecca speak about this in a lot more detail, but, but um, my organisation focuses on a particular kind of evidence which allows us to assess whether something has had a particular impact, whether, it's, whether an, in, an intervention or a reform has caused the change that you see in schools. And I think there could be a greater focus on this type of causal evidence, because without that type of causal... So there are many different types of data and evidence which are valuable, but without also looking at that type of causal evidence, it's very difficult to predict impact and, after the fact, to say whether or not... Some, you know, coming back to uh, Ross's point, uh, whether or not something was responsible for the change that you see. So I think a greater, we would advocate a greater emphasis on that. The other thing to say about that, of course, is that evidence in isolation is never sufficient. Bringing a professional judgment to bear is, is obviously essential. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think that the, the type of evidence you need depends on the questions that you're seeking to address. But in, in a sort of major reform uh, program of this this kind of nature, you need to be drawing on a wide range of evidence, which would include both the sort of formal statistical evidence as well as things like judgments and experiences. Um, you know, one source of evidence can s seldom tell us all that we need to know, and particularly when you're looking at evaluating the effectiveness or otherwise of particular interventions, the causal data that, that Danielle was talking about is really, really important. So we might have statistics that show how things are changing, but actually knowing the why those things are changing is much more, more challenging. Um, but it's not just the types of evidence either, it's also the quality of that data and the robustness and the rigour of the interpretation of it, and that is quite a skilled task, particularly when you're built bringing together evidence from different sources and different places, where I think actually harnessing better the capacity and capability that exists within Scotland, as well as in organisations south of the border, to help with that is, is really important. But, but evidence has to be you know, a key part of this. And I think as part of that, it's thinking right early on is, well, what, what, what are we trying to achieve? What are the key indicators of success? What data are we already collecting? And where are the gaps in that data that we can make sure that as we go forward, we have, a, we have the right data that will enable us to make those judgments and assessments about whether something is achieving the outcomes it's been set out to achieve? Okay. Another thing that's worth saying is that our experience in England and in some of the other countries that we're working with is schools are really enthusiastic about being part of this evidence building project. We've had more than a third of all schools in England now have been involved in one of our evaluation trials. So there's a real enthusiasm. You know, people said it just wasn't going to be possible to do that kind of trialling in schools, and it really has. There's been an enthusiasm for it, and it pulls schools and teachers and professionals themselves into the process of evidence building and learning and improvement. I mean, that's absolutely critical. It has to be more than sort of the academic community producing the evidence and then it being presented to the school. Schools have to be absolutely part of, of, of building into that evidence base and, and understanding and learning how they can use it to best effect. OK. Hey, Joanne? Yep, um, thanks very much. I'm interested in exploring what I see as the tensions in this policy and the change some of the contradictions, because it looks as if we're both wanting to direct authority down but create collaboratives which are accountable directly right up to the minister. And I think there is a, a contradiction there. Um, and also the competition between what I would see as entitlement for young people and for staff and autonomy. Um, and I wondered whether, I mean, Frank Lennon mentioned this question of a, a, a structure at school level as a check and balance against what the head teacher might do. You talked earlier about... Um, rogue head teachers and heaven for friend there would be anybody that would do such a thing but would you accept A, that there has to be limits on what the head teacher do, where are the, the checks and balances at a local level and how do you think they would look? Well, no, I, I agree with uh, the, the challenge there that um, schools if you have to have democratic accountability there has to be a mechanism at school level where that is evident frankly it doesn't exist at the moment Elected members rarely, you could ask your local councillors whether this is the case, but elected members, in my experience, rarely have ever attended a parent council meeting. And even when we had school boards, you know, I'm now at the stage in my, you know, for my career where I can look back longingly to the days of Michael Forsyth and the school boards, but there was, the, the, the school boards, I now think, provide 
an ideal, not an ideal, but an idea of a mechanism that could be reintroduced that would, that would give, with high levels of accountability, those schools that choose to go forward with it might be, it may, be, it may well be on the condition that they have an accountability me mechanism at local level that would allow scrutiny from elected members or an officer of, of, of the council. I don't think that's incompatible with high level of autonomy. I think what we've got at the moment is, frankly, local authorities that are struggling to, to provide any kind of meaningful support other than personnel support. And even then, head teachers complain repeatedly about delays in appointments or they, can, they can't get staff, they blame the local authority. The truth is that local authorities have slimmed down their staff to the point where they're offering, they're incapable of offering high level quality support. So we have a de facto system at the moment where local authorities cannot fully service the needs of the school. So I, I do feel this is for that reason an opportunity to do something about it. I, I do accept that there is this tension if the regional collaboratives end up having a powerful middle tier role, in other words, if the regional leads are line managed by the chief inspector, I mean, they were appointed by local authorities, but it's, we're still not, I'm still not clear, looking at the situation, whether the local authority leads will report to elected members from the consortium or, or what the mechanism there is. I mean, I, you know, I'm not even sure what the constitution of the panel was that made the appointment. That might give us a clue as to who's got the real authority there. But the accountability issues will certainly have to be clarified, it seems to be, before we take forward a head teacher's charter. Otherwise, you'll be in this really awkward position of having to, you know, put, if you're a head teacher, deciding whether the school's decision taken at school level, even if it's backed by tacitly by the local authority or not, might come into conflict with the regional plan. And then, so, which one prevails? I suppose I'm interested, though, that, I mean, I get that thing. I mean, I go back to this, when we thought uh, uh, placing requests, and we thought that um, school boards and all this were the most dreadful thing that had ever been uh, invented. And I suppose some of that was about reluctance to change, and I accept that. But I wonder whether um, there's another tension, which is that the school being represented by the head teacher as opposed to what the school community believes to be right. And if I can give you an example that is rational and logical and certain, and I've worked in, in some communities where you say, well, you know what, in terms of the needs of this community, we should invest in um, learning support or behaviour support as opposed to providing five hires. Yeah. But that comes right up against the desire to be a community school that can serve the needs of all the young people within that area. In those circumstances, how do you get that balance of autonomy right when it's actually about the head teacher being allowed to make a decision but actually which the school community might find they can see the logic of it but it actually ends up creating a different kind of school than maybe from the school down the road. No I, I can see the danger there I, I, frankly I don't recognise the idea of head teachers currently uh, as currently as, as their role is currently defined, exercising that degree of feudal power, as it were, whether we just decide, well, we're not having support for learning, we're having five hires. Um, in schools, that are, every school currently, in almost every authority, probably in every authority, is required to have a school negotiating committee, which is representative of the staff. The staff elect the members to it. The school negotiating committee in every school, and this would be true at primary schools as well, will agree the workload for teachers or the development plan or, or whatever for that school year. And usually that's the, the, the organisation that makes the school workload or the overall um, division of um, allocations, budget allocations, um, to school priorities. It's, it tends not to be the head teacher sitting in his or her office speaking to like-minded individuals. So it does seem to me, though, that it would be important if for no other reason other than there might be people in the community with that kind of concern, that there's a clear definition of what the accountability measures are for individual head teachers. And I think the, the parent councils currently don't provide a sufficiently robust scrutiny of what's being done at, at the moment. But then you could argue the same from local authority point of view, that, you know, that... If it, there's... One last tension that, that I would observe here is that the profession, through the professional organisation, the trade unions, want to have a level playing field for their members. So they, there's national negotiations, there's national bargaining. Being a, a, a 
principal teacher in one school should be much the same as it is in somewhere else, the same terms and conditions. Is there a tension there? I mean, you alluded to it earlier with this whole question of somebody's surplus in one school, where do they go if an individual school has authority over staffing, and yet autonomy without having control over staffing doesn't feel very logical? How is that tension managed, and is it reasonable, in your view, for trade unions and professional organisations to say, actually, there should be a, an evident sort of view of what a principal teacher should be doing or a deputy head across the, our schools? I think that's possible. I mean, I think the arrangement we've got is as good as we're going to get. We have a national pay scale. So for principal teachers, for example, there are six points on it, depending on your level of responsibility. And there's a job sizing toolkit that was agreed and developed with the professional associations, which is used in every authority. So at the moment, you can be a principal teacher of, of history in one school and be on a different salary point from a principal teacher of history in another, depending on how your job sizing turned out. And the job sizing is to do with the number of pupils, the number of sections in your subject, the line management that you have, the budget they have, and so on. So there is already in existence mechanisms to ensure a degree of fairness. But part of the difficulty here is that the schools are so diverse, both in terms of their intake and the amount of money they can attract from pupil equity funding or from other forms of deprivation allowance or, or whatever, that it's impossible to, to match individual principal teacher posts exactly across the system. But I think the system at the moment is as good as, is as, good as we need f for that kind of thing. And I think it, it, it would permit a degree of judgment to be made at school level without professional associations feeling that they, their member of staff was being unfairly treated or not. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ruth? Good afternoon. Um, good morning, panel. Um, we've covered regional support structures and, and collaboration sort of quite a bit this morning, but um, bearing in mind that um, what Daniel um, Mason said there, that uh, earlier collaboration has to focus on pupil outcomes, and that we've, we've spoken quite a bit about the challenges of, of collaboration. I'd be interested to hear um, how regional improvement collaboratives can improve the quality of, of, of support provided to schools and teachers, and therefore um, improve that interaction between teachers and pupils which is in the classroom which is of course the the most important thing and I think we've probably um covered accountability as well but that was the other bit that I was interested in so if you've anything sort of further to add on that um I'd be interested to hear that too when it comes to collaboration as I've said the the evidence suggests that what's important is uh, that it's no surprise, collaboration in and, in and of itself is not enough. There has to be a clear focus um, and uh, a structure and sort of scaffolding around what it is that everyone's trying to achieve. So we've looked at interventions where teachers, broadly speaking, they meet, they talk about evidence, they go back, they talk about that with their colleagues. That doesn't seem to have a huge impact on attainment in schools where teachers are coming together with a school that's developed and tested an intervention and there's a lot of structure around it, there's a manual, there's a clear link between the evidence on teaching and learning and how this intervention is going to improve uh, outcomes in schools. We see, we see higher effects and clearer effects with that kind of collaboration. So in terms of a focus on teaching and learning, that's what I mean with regard to that. Um, just on accountability, on a slightly different topic, but as you asked about it, one of the things that came up when we were preparing for this was the importance of looking at range within schools as well as average attainment. So looking at the sort of mean scores within a school or mean results can mask poor attainment for particular groups of pupils. And especially when you're introducing um, change and reforms, as is happening at the moment, making sure that all pupils are benefiting and that all teachers and all lessons within a school are you know, delivering for pupils is really important. And one way to look at that is to look at the range of outcomes a school is achieving as well as just the averages. I would say that the most important thing about this is that it's school-led. Because if it's top-down, imposed, mandated from outside the school, it's unlikely to get by and necessary to make real change at classroom level effective. So if we can encourage schools to identify where they need the development without 
feeling that they're somehow selling their staff down the river by saying that they're, they're no good or ineffective or whatever. Um, that, would be a, that would be really helpful. The regional collaborators might be able to facilitate that. So if you're in, in a small authority, I don't know what size Murray is, but you know, if there are five or six secondary schools, you might only have three or four teachers of modern studies. And you may say in that environment, that's not a wide enough professional base to encourage real professional development. So a regional collaborator might be able to set up something that would that would help uh, address that. And at primary school, there might be similar um, offerings that could be made. I just don't know. I think the difficulty would be the, you know, the, the mechanism by which schools access the collaboration on offer. And I think we have to get to the stage that where it is genuinely school-led and teacher-led and that it comes from a full and frank self-evaluation rather than you know, a, a kind of judgmental um, decision on where the weak subjects are or where the weak teachers are. Yeah. Can I j just to follow up on that, and, and I heard what you said about sort of bringing people along and it being school-led and incremental change, and I, I totally, um, I, I agree with that in terms of getting people's buy-in, but how do we marry that with saying that, you know, structure's important, the changes are important, the changes have to happen? H how do we get that balance Right, what would that look like? Well, I, I, I think we need the moral authority before we get to that stage. This is part of the difficulty with The only authority that counts in schools now is moral authority. You know, children are not going to respect you just because you're the head teacher. So there has got to be a better justification than you have this position of authority. But the same is true of the profession as a whole. So we have to get to the stage, and I understand this is difficult, and it's more difficult if we're, we're dealing in in timescales that are defined by the Scottish Parliament, if we're saying it has to be done by this, it may take longer, but we don't know how the momentum might build. I think part of the difficulty with this incremental system is it's not been tried yet, that we think the only way to do it is, is, is to mandate it, and arguably that will produce as many challenges as any other way of doing it. And I'm simply arguing from a school-led, school point of view, that schools have to be individually involved in whether or not they take on the full level of, they are ready to take on the full level of head teacher charter responsibility. I suspect that initially there will be a reluctance, but there will be enthusiasts who will then build it. And it could well be that if not within the lifetime of this parliament, but shortly thereafter, there will have been significant, a significant evidence base, which was worth scrutinising. We've not been good at that in Scotland. We had no independent evaluation of curriculum for excellence. I mean, astonishing, though it may seem. None. We have social science departments at our universities that, come up with, that could come up with metrics other than SIMD or whatever. Are we asking them? I don't know. We don't appear to be. So I think part of the difficulty we've got is this kind of lack of imagination. What might we do? And, and at what level are we en really engaging the profession and harnessing their enthusiasm and passion for learning and teaching. Thank you. Yeah. Last question. <clears throat> there, there is precedent, of course, the, the, the regional partnership of the Northern Alliance is something that I want to, to, to bring up. And uh, my, my previous question was about pilots. I mean, it's not a pilot because they just went ahead and did it, but it's an unofficial pilot. So what about the Northern Alliance could we learn from? Because I think that's one of the reasons, the success of that has been one of the reasons why this is actually come to the fore has been something to be discussed in the governance review, the idea that a regional collaboration has worked in the north of Scotland. Therefore, let's learn from that and roll it out further. So what's been good about that that maybe could allay some of the fears we have about a sort of another tier of administration? Well, it does appear that it has worked, but I mean, the question is, according to what evidence? You know, what are we evaluating when they say the Northern Alliance work? What, what appears to me to be attractive about it is that it wasn't mandated from anywhere outside the authorities. It does seem to be the authority-led, I have to say, rather than school-led, but presumably the authorities are working on pressure from schools. So it has the right feel about it. I know this sounds a, a bit nebulous and so on, but that's a hair worth splitting. I think the biggest problem we're going to have with the government's in, um, direction of policy, which I strongly support, the biggest problem and the biggest obstacle is going to be grudging compliance. And that's going to set the culture back. But there is no neutral gear in education. 
So if we're not moving this forward, that grudging compliance will become a drag on the entire system. It will be very difficult to, to move. And that's a big danger of, of the current reforms. I, I simply don't know enough about the detail of the Netherlands to answer your question fully, but I would imagine that if the pressure has come from the schools and the authorities have got together themselves and moved things forward, that's exactly the model that I think we should be looking at. Probably a, a, a real pressing case for an evaluation of how the Northern Alliance has worked and maybe what they could maybe um, do in terms of sharing their experience with the rest of the country so that people can build on that and have regional collaborations that are uh, right for the, their individual areas. Uh, the difficulty, of course, is the government has, has defined these collaboratives. They've told the authorities which collaborative they're in, so they haven't come organically from the authorities. And in fact, Argyll and Butte, I think, is in the same regional collaborative as Aberdeen. And I think it's important as well when we say the Northern Alliance has worked, and I'm not close enough to know whether it has or not, but be clear, well, what do we mean by that? Or worked on what basis? Has it worked in improving outcomes, educational outcomes, and improving educational performance? And or has it worked in terms of actually getting buy-in and support for change to actually... I think it does fit into that sort of category of natural experiment, but being really clear about oh, what are the indicators of success that then can be measured and evaluated, um, that we really know whether it's worked or not, and, it, and what things might have actually contributed towards that success or otherwise. Of course, if we want to be flexible around this, it's not one size fits all. So it might have worked in terms for, for the region that it, it, it works in, but maybe it may not work in another part of Scotland to know the context and a wider area, you know, set of factors rather than that, you know, just, you know, whether it's improved education performance, but then you actually understand whether, how far it might be transferable in full or part to other places. Okay, thank you. Uh, very quickly. It's a very tiny supplementary. Just on that point, it was just whether you thought that geography itself was the best or sole uh, sort of categorisation, I guess, for, for collaboration or whether there are more imaginative solutions? Well, I, I'm, in I'm in favour of multiple collaborations. I mean, I, I think that's part of the difficulty with this. There isn't a collaborative structure that can be set up that everyone can be put into the, an, an appropriate collaboration. So I think it would it'd be possible, for example, for a secondary school to be on a nationwide network of similar or dissimilar schools, whatever, depending on what, what, what they're looking for, and to be very closely associated with a cluster and perhaps with, uh, for some other purposes, other schools much more geographically um, convenient. But I think, the idea, I think possibly we have to get away from the idea that there is a single model of collaboration that we can roll out uh, to all schools. That, that's not going to be like that. And I think if we allow the system and encourage the system to generate its own innovations, why don't we do that? Why don't we allow schools to decide for themselves when they're ready to accept the national policy framework and give them a period of time and, and then review it independently on the basis of the evidence that we've accrued? On that particular question as well, based on uh, data from English schools, we have something called the Families of Schools database at the EEF. And what it does is collect schools together based on various attributes, such as the proportion of disadvantaged children, where they are, their results... Um, and a school can go and look at how they're doing compared to similar schools. And there's now experimental uh, statistics out in Scotland that would allow a sort of similar thing. And that can um, sometimes show really revealing things like you often will find that a school with a very high level of disadvantaged pupils is doing really well for its disadvantaged pupils and really well for its pupils on average. And you compare that to another school with, in a seemingly similar context that's doing much worse and it's... It's not about accountability, it's not about blame, but it's about looking and saying, my school is similar to that school and they are achieving something. And we can make a change to make that happen. Thank you very much for, the, for your evidence. That was very helpful. Um, just as a point of interest, we are going up to visit up northeast soon to speak to the Northern Alliance. It sounds like a Star Wars site or something like that. But, uh, so maybe we'll see for ourselves just how effective and what impact it could have in other parts of the country. So once again, thank you very much. And I, I now close the public session. <laughs>